idiopathic Parkinson's disease for which there is no known cause. Um, these are complicated issues. Um, and so the idea that you can go on the site, exposure matrix by yourself, and then go to your treating physician and say, what do you think? And then your doctor says, yeah, I agree with you. You were out there, you were exposed to all sorts of stuff. I'm going to write a letter, and, and we'll see if we can't get this claim paid. Well, those letters, they need to be well rationalized, and they need to comply with the uh, requirements of the program. We, we see letters all the time from doctors that say, it's very possible that my patient was exposed to this or that toxic substance, and therefore uh, I believe that it could be that, that it, was, it was a cause of their death. And that's just not going to work. It doesn't apply. The, the very specific standard is that the occupational exposure is a significant factor that aggravated the treatment well, at least as likely as not. So a 50-50 probability that it's a significant factor that aggravated, contributed to, or caused your condition. Um, that's a very specific standard. It's not more likely than not. It's not 51%. It's a 50-50 proposition. It gives the doctor some leeway. We don't have to perfectly identify the cause, it needs to be a 50-50 proposition that it, that it aggravated, contributed to a cause. The point is just that your treating physician has a lot of patience and not a lot of experience in the program. So the idea that you can go to your treating physician and have and, and, and do it without any assistance, uh, I think is is a fallacy within the program. And it bothers me when I hear uh, claims examiners, usually in the district office, say, you don't need an attorney, you don't need an advocate, you don't need any help, you can do this all by yourself. Just, just go and look at the site exposure matrix on the internet and just match everything up, it'll, it'll all be fine. And then they send it to one of their district medical consultants. Now, is that doctor going to give you the kind of the kind of report that you're hoping for, or is that doctor going to feel some some uh, some inclination to uh, to say that you know your claim is not that great? Um, another thing we run into is with the impairment rating. Now you're entitled to an impairment rating every two years. And you can go to the Department of Labor, and the Department of Labor will find a doctor for you that, that is on there, that is under contract with them. And that doctor will prepare an impairment rating. The impairment ratings are performed based on the, fifth, the, the AMA Guide to Whole Body Impairment, Whole Person Impairment. And so that doctor will go on want to go into the guide and figure out what your situation is and provide you with an impairment. Now, you can also go to, a, go to your own physician. And the benefit there is, if you ask the district office whether this physician they're going to send you has done some good impairment ratings in the past, they won't tell you. They won't give you any kind of record. So to the extent that there are advocates that are available to help, at least you can learn a little bit from their experience in terms of what kind of impairment ratings have been done by various doctors. Um, we run into a lot of resistance. There are some, there are some impairment doctors that write reports that are so plain and favorable that they get rejected. So, so you can run into trouble at both ends of the spectrum. But these, these are issues that are not, not terribly easy to manage on your own sometimes. And so the advocates uh, that are out there can be helpful. Um, you can do these claims by yourself. Some claims are quite simple. It's just that very often you find out late in the game how complicated it is. And by that time, you might have some problems.
problems with your records. So, in any event, those are a couple of things I wanted to say about the impairment rating process. You can get a new impairment every two years, and, and uh, you should be careful to do that. Also, I presume that everyone in the audience realizes that if your condition becomes terminal, they will, they will expedite your claim. And so I run into people with claims, and they say, well, my father had a claim, and then he died, and, and now the claim is, now there's no more claim. In other words, claims die with the worker, and then, and then the, uh, and then any descendants would, would be able to file a claim. But if you have three siblings of a father, and one of the siblings dies, then the two siblings divide that payment. So it doesn't, it doesn't pass through the estate. That's a complicated way of saying it. But in any event, the terminal designation is important. If someone's sick and can be described as terminal, and that's usually considered someone with six months to live, then the claim is processed very quickly. We get, we get final decisions. Pardon? Part B or Part E? Both. Both. Any, any, any claimant who's terminal, that's even a survivor claim. Any claimant that's terminal, their claim can be expedited. And when, when there's an expedited claim, things that take months can be accomplished in weeks or days. Um, and so with that, I'm going to pass it back to Dr. Newman. I believe number uh, one of the thoughts that came to my mind, I see some of the food traffic in here, uh, especially for the older males like me, if you have tiny bladder disease, uh, the gentleman's room uh, is out the door to the right, and then there'll be one of the doors on the left. Uh, but also, I just want to piggyback on what uh, Attorney Stevens was telling us, uh, because one of the problems that we run into is what I call it running out the clock. All of the game playing that you've heard about, if the claimant should die and there's still no decision made, if there is a surviving spouse, there are certain rules to that. But in many instances, if the claimant is gone, so is the claim. And that's why I wish that there was a way that all of these could be basically input into the system, handled properly, and then come out the other side uh, with a claim in front of the answer. All right, okay, go ahead.
very much recommended. Now, you don't have to pay your primary physician because he's your primary, he or she is your 
monetary decision, and they're already paying the they're, they're already being paid to treat these conditions. And so that's a good place to start. But I, I don't think I'm the only one that finds that it's very difficult to get a good letter on causation, on some of these more difficult causation issues from your treating physician. Well, we've had to hear it, and we're still waiting on the final decision. Well, and that's, that's another point. These claims are forever. Your claim never, never disappears. As long as you're alive, if you have a claim, you can make your claim. Until they eliminate the program, your claim, if there's no statute of limitations, and so you can bring a claim at any time. So you get your final decision, and then you feel like, well, that's it. But it's not it. If, if you hire someone to make the, the connection, and it's a good letter, they should reopen your claim and, and accept it if you, if you provided the necessary evidence. Is this your pre-existing problem that is that is that is 
becoming worse as you get older? Or is this a problem that would never have been nearly as significant if you hadn't had chemo? So those are the kind of issues you get into trying to get the secondary condition accepted as a consequential condition. Um, I want to talk about something that should be near and dear to a lot of the men who came here. Um, my name is Lisa Park, and my husband and I were both employees at the Fort Smith facility for over 20 years. My mother passed away already from mainly a dysplastic syndrome from being a handler. Uh, Al and I both were in the police department. He spent 10 years there as an SRT commander and as a senior safety engineer and I was an environmental safety and health specialist. Having said all that, um, prostate cancer used to be an included illness. When this program very first started, um, some people weren't aware of the program, and at its very beginnings, prostate cancer was a proper condition. Suddenly, it evaporated, and everyone goes to the mantra that this affects all men, so therefore it's no longer included. I did a very unscientific research snap on Facebook, uh, people that we worked with. Out of the police department alone, just during the tenure that Calvin and I were in there, we have 33 dead officers from cancer, 25 with other cancers and related illnesses, and nine of the 14 men on his TRT team, including him, had prostate cancer before the age of 65. Now, I'm not a scientist, but our good friend Dr. Dave is. Statistically, this reeks. And I think that we need to have the board revisit prostate cancer because especially people in any of the protective forces were exposed to chemicals and radiation with zero and I mean zero PPE protection. And that's because when they would take cylinders offline in the early days, they were told to turn their head to have a badge and a shotgun that would save them from anything. In the early days before the bolts were built, police officers sat among the cylinders while they popped off, and your station was in between five and eight inch cylinders. The problem with the site exposure matrices is that people who didn't know what other people's occupations were developed those exposures. People, especially in the protective forces, were exposed to high levels of cadmium, lead, arsenic, and radiation. And a combination of those two things, from all the research and very current research that I have found and Dr. Davis found, is an absolute witch's group for prostate cancer. So my contention is, what are the qualifications of the DOL physicians or toxicologists who are making these unfounded determinations on prostate cancer based on science that is prior to 1990? That's all I have to say, ma'am. Well, that's also what we have addressed also individually as our representatives, is that prostate 